Hey everybody, here is Damian Gergiev from the Break It Down Show and today's guest is David Best. Now, I can't resist to not make this pun and say he's truly the best. He's the frontman of one of my favorite bands called Fujiya and Miyagi and if you didn't hear their music, you definitely should. They are an electronic band from Brighton, England, formed 19 years ago. Their song Uh was featured in a scene of the legendary crime TV series Breaking Bad when Jesse and Bejar are cooking meth in the van in the middle of nowhere. Well, the song Vagaries of Fashion is featured in an episode of How to Get Away with Murder, so you know their music sounds awesome. You can visit them on fuchia-miyagi.co.uk and support their work. That's fuchia-miyagi.co.uk While listening to this cool electronic music, here's what I ask you to do. Open a new tab and go to savedbrave.org. Do that today, and here's why. Today is Veterans Day, so it's symbolic if you go to that website and give these guys what they really need. And that's your support. We truly appreciate if you support the Break It Down show too with subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to it. And we would ask you to share it with your friends or write us a little comment. Maybe something like, this David fella has to come to my city and have a show with his band. Yeah, by the way, I saw Fuji and Miyagi a few months ago and I had a wonderful time. Trust me. I mean, these guys shared the stage with bands like New Order. Come on. Me and Pete sat down and had a great chat with this really cool guy called David Best. Now, without further ado, enjoy the show. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is David Best from Fuji Miyagi, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, this is cool, man. We've had a lot of musicians on, and it's always great to get musicians from around the world. You're obviously British, so I want to get into a little bit of that. For some reason, bands in Great Britain don't always translate over here to the U.S. where, where I'm at. But you might translate over to where, because Damien's co-hosting and he produced this episode, you might translate over to Macedonia. Mm-hmm. When bands from Great Britain don't hop over, like um, Paul Weller is probably the best example. He's such right. a huge guy in the UK, but he can barely even tour over here because he's playing small venues. It's just not worth his time, you know? Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and equally, people like uh, Tom Petty, who's massive over there, doesn't translate really here. What do you make of that? There must be something ingrained in a country's musical psyche that doesn't like Tom Weller and uh, Paul Weller and uh, Tom Petty. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It's just odd, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is odd. It doesn't make sense. Elvis Costello has sort of done it, you know, like he's very well known, but he's more underground over here. Is Elvis mm-hmm. Costello huge in the UK, would you say? He's highly respected, I think. Yeah. When he first came out, because obviously it was like, Post punk or new wave, he was kind of thought of quite edgy. Yeah, and he's, but yeah, he's really respected. I'm sure he could sell out shows quite easily. Yeah, hi from me. I'm happy to welcome you on the Break It Down show. And a month ago, I was on a festival in Skopje called Strava Mladi, and there was a local band playing in, on the stage. They're called to Rip. Yeah, and they came to the end of their show, and suddenly. David Best from Fuji and Miyagi gets on stage to perform <laughs> their featuring song. Yeah, the song is called a Rotator. And the first thing that popped into my head was, you got to get David on the Break It Down show. So the next thing I did, I found your email and you immediately responded. So thank you for coming on the show and I'm excited to have a chat with you, David. Oh, yeah, thanks again for asking us. It was a uh, rib. We, we played a few shows with Rib, and uh, yeah, yeah. it's nice to be asked by them to, to collaborate on that on that song. I think it turned out really really well. But we hadn't practiced before the show, so I was a bit nervous. <laughs> I just oh, really? pr- listened to that yeah, song so thirty great. times on the plane. Oh, nice. Let me start with the beginning. What was David's childhood like? When was the moment when you knew I'm doing music for a living and that's it? Pretty early on, I think when I realized I wasn't going to be a professional footballer. Hey, this is P. Day Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org, 
click on the donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. Pretty early on. I think when I realized I wasn't going to be a professional footballer, <laughs> as in play for Arsenal, I realized that maybe I should go to plan B, which was to, to be a rock star. <laughs> no, or just, just to do music. Uh, no, Arsenal. I'm not from Brighton, but I've lived here a long time. Mm-hmm. But music, my dad is a big Gene Vincent fan and, okay. uh, and he saw like Eddie Cochran and all those people when he was a kid. So that was in the house. But equally, my mum liked kind of the carpenters and stuff, So, which is nice too. But it, I suppose it was my real introduction and what really made me want to do music was uh, listen to John Peel show i'm sure you've heard of him it's a very famous dj yeah the peel it. sessions more underground over here but the peel sessions were were incredible records to to collect yeah and he was a lot of people's introduction because obviously this is before the internet to uh, say before my time like can and captain b fart but for me like the fall or so lots of my favorite groups were, were discovered through john peel but going back to the original question i think i i just i felt music very early on and I think you either feel music or you don't and probably when I was seven or eight I just wanted that's all I wanted to do I want to ask you about John Peel a little bit more if I could just jump in and take us back because it is you know he broke bands like Jimi Hendrix Susie and the Banshees all these the damned the alarm I mean everybody who was anybody during the time uh, that he was on of course now in the U.S. we got it primarily via records that were produced but you all got it you know, on his radio show live, but did the records also translate for you guys as well? He was like the internet before the internet, really. So yeah, he kind of pointed us in the right direction, but also you'd chat with your friends and you'd go to record shops like, like you would. For for us, it's it's kind of, well, it's a a big shame that he died when he did full stop, but I often wish that he'd carried on and I wonder if he'd have liked our band and because we haven't really got that person who really supports us on on radio wise and uh, in my head i like to think maybe it would have been him is that possible these days though i mean so often it seems like they just have a pre-programmed playlist that isn't very varied and it's just you know it's hard to penetrate yeah and they definitely have their favorites but i don't know his taste was so idiosyncratic and not geared toward the mainstream or getting more listeners because he didn't need to i think we might have fitted into that Mm -hmm. Along with Steve Lewis, you're the founding member of Fuchi and Miyagi. And what were the beginnings of the band like? Well, it's funny. It's kind of well documented to people who know the, the group, how we met. But, but we, we met playing five-a-side football and we chatted afterwards. And he was doing techno and I was coming from a like more guitar-orientated background. Uh, so but we kind of bonded over Can and Carl Craig. That was kind of the blueprint for the early, the early beginnings of the group. So we started doing music together and we ended up going to, he's from Chelmsford in Essex. So we ended up going and staying at his parents had like, like a, a, a annex to their house. So we stayed up, we, we went there to work in rubbish jobs to save up for a fi- first sampler. And it took us like about three years to finish one song. And it sounds crazy now, like it, it obviously wasn't working. So what if it takes three years to finish one song, why carry on? But for whatever reason, we did. And so that was from about 97. So, mm. so that takes us to about 2000, 2001. Steve went away for a year to Australia. Then our album came out, first album came out 2002. But it was still very much uh, like a bedroom record, you know, like it wasn't designed to play live. But we ended up playing live and that's when we kind of made the leap of becoming more of a, a group rather than an electronics project. And it changed quite rapidly, really, from then on. Yeah. When I was preparing for the interview, I read one comment on some of your YouTube songs. And the comment is, listen to Pink Floyd, The Cure, Massive Attack, and Chemical Brothers, then mix them all <laughs> to obtain your Fuji and Miyagi. Do you agree with this? It's funny. I don't, th- I don't think I listen to any of those groups. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> maybe a bit of The Cure and Sid Barrett era, Pink Floyd. You just make the music and you put it out there and everyone has their different perceptions of where the influences came from or what it reminds them of. And that's great. But uh, no, I, I think early on we were very, you could tell our influences and, and I always felt too much. I always thought the, the noy, the can, uh, mm-hmm. talking heads. But I think as time goes on, I just, when we start a song, I don't think, oh, let's try and sound like an amalgamation of the... Pink Floyd, The Cure, and Massive Tech, and the other one. <laughs> it just 
comes out as Fuji Miyagi now. So it's quite a nice place to be at. When you guys are getting your ideas for your songs, I mean, okay, so it's not Pink Floyd, it's not Massive Attack, whatever, but it does come from somewhere. You guys are, are you guys bringing in ideas individually and small things? Is someone having a big idea and you all pile on? How does it work for you guys? There's no one way, really. Sometimes I'll write individually, but it, that will be like real sparse kind of bare bones stuff because I'm not a producer. It doesn't interest me, whereas Steve's far more into production. I like just writing songs and the structures and the harmonic content and stuff. Other times Steve might do something music and I might write the words on, but that's a lot harder to write music words on music that has existed from someone else than it is to do it from the ground up and then sometimes occasionally not too much but sometimes we come together as a group jamming has never really suited us okay so you're not really like a jam band that kind of comes through you, you have to work from a, uh, a foundation did you guys yeah. learn that in the studio working or how did you figure that that was your formula? Because there are so many different ways to do this. Mm. You know, like you think about just all of the great bands that are out there. They all kind of similar, or, I'm sorry, dissimilar way. Yeah, sure. I think because we started electronic, that's always been the kind of the reset button that we always resort to, you know, sometimes a, uh, and also financial reasons, it's a lot easier to program a drum machine than it is to pay for a studio to record drums, which are very hard to capture. I mean, we've done that a lot, but equally we love drum machines. So right. it depends on the album. We always, sometimes we're accused of always sounding very similar, but I think that's because of our aesthetic is maybe quite narrow in terms of the limitations of my voice uh, and the stripped down nature of it. But we do always try and vary it. So each project, each album, has a different feel in terms of how we record it or how we produce it, whether that's more of a live album or more like the last one, flashback, a lot more electronic. You're running your own record label, is that true? Yeah, we've we've released the last two albums and we reissued Transparent Things mm -hmm. as well. Is it hard to run your own label and also writing songs and going on tours? It's probably not as hard as doing a proper job. <laughs> it's hard in terms of all you want to do is make up songs, but you have to do all the boring stuff. But when you actually physically get a record that you've made both sound-wise and physically, you know, you do get a real sense of achievement. Also with streaming and stuff, with a band who's not massive or anything, it's kind of important to hoover all that up in order to keep going. So if you're the label, you benefit from all that. If you're not, you don't. Do you have any other musicians or bands in the record label? Or just for Jamie? No. Uh, I did a, a side project, I suppose. I don't know why people call it side projects, but another project with Ed Chivers, who plays drums in Fuji Miyagi, called X Display Model. And we released that, but that was just a digital release. We would like to, but again, it comes down to costs. And uh, it's always we want to do the next Fuji Miyagi one, and we haven't really got access to look elsewhere at the moment. As you guys try to decide your projects and, and you look at the finances that are required to put out a new album, how do you make the business decisions? I mean, it's one thing, you know, like a band like Fishbone has always made the artistic choice and their influence is big, but also limited because they've always gone the way of the artist thing. So how do you balance the the business side of we know we could tour on this a little longer, let's go out, let's let's expand our market, let's go spend time in this country and tour on this out. You know, how do you do all those decisions? Well, that's an interesting question. I think for us the the states is we used to play the states a lot and there was a lot of interest there and a lot of press and that's kind of lessened. So it's kind of makes you think maybe we'll give that a rest for a bit. Whereas, mm. for example, in, in China, there's a lot of interest there. And we play to crowds that are twice as big or three times as big. So it's a bit trial and error. But also, I mean, you can, Steve is very into his statistics. Mm. <laughs> so he can pinpoint probably down to the one or two people where they're listening to in what town, in what Scandinavian country. So you could pinpoint it like that. But it, I think we just make sure we've got enough money to do the record get some shows we've got a, a good agent in europe and it kind of just falls into place really but when we don't do big tours either mm -hmm. is it hard to make money on a big tour is that why you don't take them on and you just kind of rely on the uh, proven method then or yeah i mean i kind of see tours as more promotional rather than anything else i mean mm -hmm. especially with the states you've got the visas which are a nightmare to get 
really expensive and then touring's expensive because it's such a big country so yeah it's tricky but most of our like I say live stuff for me is promotional on the whole it's it's the records that that uh, can bring in income in order for us to do the next record mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah where's your favorite place you've ever played is it somewhere in Asia maybe or the United States or Europe or uh, home? Well, it's it's funny. You tend to, your favorite places tend to be the places that you have your favorite shows in. Because, you know, even if you've been in that place for half an hour and you looked outside for half an hour and you had a great show, you think, oh, I love that place. But, you know, the first time in, we, we were in New York sticks in my mind because uh, we were less known in the UK than we were in the States. And it was always an ambition to go to New York. Dublin was very special because that's the first place that people sung our songs back to yes. us. But there was only like maybe eight or nine people in the audience, but they were all like high kicking and singing. <laughs> and, and that's a nice memory. Yeah, I mean, probably New York, Paris, Dublin. I, I'm kind of fascinated with, with China just because it's new to us. But mm. uh, we've been lucky. We've been all over the place. You also played with New Order many times over the years. How do you feel when you share the stage with guys like Bernard Sumner or Stephen Morris? Yeah, we, we played, we've supported them twice, uh, once in Manchester and once in Dublin more recently. It's great. I mean, it's when I was a kid, one of the first records I bought was Unknown Pleasures. Mm. And I remember just staring at the, listening to it and just staring at the sleeve and then the, the white inner sleeve and then turning it around and do it, you know, and it meant a lot to me. And, and as I got older, I got more i had like a gap but then i got into new order more and more and more so when i found out that Stephen and uh, jillian were, were were fans mm -hmm. of what we did it was yeah i mean it's lovely uh, and to play because obviously we're they've got great songs and they you know they've got such a heritage of such a history and we haven't really got that to that extent but their crowd is a great crowd for us to play to because there is a crossover, right. you know, it's electronic, but yeah. there is a live element and a yeah. great opportunity for us. But more from a fan point of view, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's the things like that. Like we, su we supported The Fall as well. Mm. And uh, they used my guitar on a song called Blindness and, and things like that stick in your mind. And, and they're the, my favorite things about being in a band, live-wise, I suppose. So one of my favorite bands is New Order. I, I love the heck out of them. I saw them at the Hollywood Bowl, and their show is a well-established road show. That, and I'm not sure if they've revamped it since we saw them because they've toured this show for a long time. But first off, the musicianship is, is just incredible. They're so tight. When they In the 80s when they were out, though, people were pretty hard on them live because there's a lot of keyboard playing. you know. And it was it's how do you get away from the keyboards long enough to put on a show right? when there's a lot of things going on? When you see them and you work with them as pros, what are you stealing from that? You know, stealing is not the right word, but when you see what they do, what are you pulling out and going, we need more of this, we need more of that? Because they are they, they have evolved into the, a band that can do anything. They can be a heritage act. They could go tour on a new album if they wanted. What do you learn? I think that, that they've managed to, uh, what's quite insular, introverted music, they've managed to somehow turn it on its head and be quite inclusive you know when they play to a crowd it seems everyone's included even though the songs are very personal yeah which is it's, it's no mean feat i think going back to when i read that when they started they because they were using quite primitive synths and they used to go wrong all the time so i think they were more worried about things going <laughs> wrong than maybe being performing i don't know i mean when i see groups i like i don't really have my business head on i just enjoy them for, mm. for, for what they are i mean the last the dublin show they did five or six joy division songs mm. which was i think the first time they did three and, and that was exciting you know to hear decades live mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. a real goosebump moment it's such a the show i saw maybe like two years ago they for sure transitioned i think it was even in one of the encores you know and they just did a joy division encore and to have that gear, you know, and obviously you don't want to go through the struggle to, you know, end up with with that benefit, but to have those songs just waiting, you know, and <laughs> it, you know what I'm saying? Like, it just hangs yeah. there. You're like, at some point, they're going to break out these monsters. Because Joy Division, for the amount of time they are around, song for song, is as badass as any band ever. Oh, incredible. Uh, and it still feels timeless. I don't know. I mean, it's not just to do with the songs, but obviously that's to do with Martin Hannett's 
yeah. production as well, which adds to that. But uh, but also they could just play all New Order songs and everyone would be happy. Totally. Yeah. They're in two of the greatest yeah. groups of our lifetime. So, yeah. How do they, you know, that's the thing. So we one of the things we do in the show is called an album fight, right? And you take two albums of similar length of tracks, typically, and you go track one versus track one. So, you know, we might go, like Purple Rain's a nine track album. We put it up against Thriller, also a nine track album. And then you just mm-hmm. go and you, and you judge each each round like a boxing fight. In the album fight format, when you go through, you know, a band like New Order is just so tight, but there's something in those songs that translates a timelessness. And we were talking about that. What is it that makes Joy Division, you know, other bands just timeless and other things just absolutely dated and good in its own right, but like I would say that Pink Floyd, for as great as they are, a lot of their music sounds dated. I can't put yeah. my finger on it. Help me put my I think finger it's te- on what it is. I think it's technology. I mean, that's what yes. the Doors always said, that they didn't have wah pedals because they didn't want to date it. Right. I mean, they did with the huge, you know, kind of organ sound. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so the technology often dictates the, the decade musically you're in, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Like 80s was the era of drum machines, et cetera. So, but then also I kind of quite like it when it's, when you're in an era, there's so many people try and be timeless, that classic sound, but uh-huh. that in itself is kind of, I don't know, it's been done to death. I, I think, so our last record was a, a nostalgic look back to the music of our childhood, mm. but I kind of think the next one, I'm kind of want it to be now, you know, I want to use all the gimmicks. I want to definitely put it, in 2021 or whenever we release it i think there's something to be said for that it's quite nice yeah so over the years the style of writing and recording has changed i can sense that in your in your latest album flashback yeah definitely i think that one of the things that's benefited us is from not being particularly successful because <laughs> i think looking at similar groups who have been more successful than us and are told they're great all the time they tend to just do the same thing over and over again which does well. So then they're told they're great again and they do it again. We've uh, probably got quite low self-esteem and always think that everyone hates us. Mm. So we feel like we've got something to prove and we want to go explore new territories. And that's kind of what keeps the interest up really. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there's the, there's, but also often bands get better at playing their instruments, but makes their records worse. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so often I'm really wary of that. And sometimes I try and approach guitar like I've never picked it up before, <laughs> you know, and just get some pedals and just make odd noises. And often that sounds exciting to me rather than, you know, practicing blue scales for eternity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I would disagree that you're unsuccessful because you have songs that feature in shows like Breaking Bad or Misfits or how to get away with murder. Yeah. Skin. I'm not saying we haven't done well. We have, but, but if you compare mm-hmm. us to bands of similar, who get lumped in with us yeah. there. Uh, they have major label backing or big independent mm-hmm. backing. And we've always pretty much been yeah. very Working. low key or done it ourselves. Have you ever considered like making a soundtrack for a movie or a theatrical show? Because the songs that are in breaking bed or how to get away with murder are a good fit for the scenes. Yeah, I mean, we'd love to. I actually have done a soundtrack with mm-hmm. uh, Ed, who I mentioned, who, who plays drums and is also in a group called AKDK. Uh, we did a soundtrack uh, to a, from a film by Anya Stapleton uh, about Lucia Joyce, which is James Joyce's daughter. Uh, it's like a, a quite dance orientated. So, uh, so we have done that, and I'd, I'd love to do more of that. And I'd love to do Fuji Miyagi have have that because I think we could do it quite well. But again, it's, it's getting the opportunity, really, and uh, the timing to do it. If, if we were asked, I mean, I, I know it's probably slightly cliched, but I'd love to do kind of like a real John Carpenter type sci-fi hmm. soundtrack, one of those, <laughs> like a real nasty 80s kind of feel to it. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. So hopefully that will happen in the future. I want to go back to playing guitar because we have a lot of conversations on Twitter, you know, especially amongst us who are doing this album judging. And someone kind of reminds me of like the edge, uh, you know, and how he sort of gets gets lost sonically and kind of gathers these different sounds. And I, I think we all have to like acknowledge 
it's not about virtuosity and notes per minute and blues scale type things. His playing is much more unbound. You know, he just is looking mm-hmm. for landscapes that he creates sonically. Does that resonate more with what your creative side is trying to do? Or is it something even different than that? I think that's attracted to to people who are coming up with their own things and, and making their own sounds far more than I am people showing off. Although I love Prince, sure. you know, who doesn't, but in general, yeah, it's the, I always think imagination trumps virtuosity. And uh, I think if you rely on technical skill, it can become a bit beige and samey. And this is why like often you have schools that teach music, like how to be a rock band and stuff. And it just, I'm just more into giving someone or suggesting 20 groups, listen to them and do it yourself. You know, I don't think you can teach it is what I'm, I'm saying. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You have schools that teach music, like how to be a rock band and stuff. And it's just, I'm just more into giving someone or suggesting 20 groups, listen to them and do it yourself. You know, I don't think you can teach it is what I'm I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I think you're right. There is that. And again, you got to come back to how much artistry and how much business sense do you need to, to blend in too, right? Because if you're so esoteric and artistic, nobody wants to, or nobody's capable of going with you on the ride, you have nobody on the ride with you. And, and there's a cost to that, right? Like, you have to yeah do you have a sense for where your audience is like this is a this is going to be a leap but our hardcore fans will go with us or you know do you have a sense for that do you care about that i do care what people who like us think but i i kind of know that what they really probably want is a uh, 10 crap rock bangers you know <laughs> uh, motoric kind of, and uh but we've done that you know in bits and pieces and i'm more interested in exploring places i haven't been to yet so and i think generally people come with us and it'll be nice to get new people as well and what, what's really nice is uh over the last few years our demographic of uh people who come to see us it's a lot younger yeah so i mean everyone's welcome but it, sometimes it's nice not to look out in the sea of people who look like me yeah yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, yeah. well it's always nice to not do that but it's nice to have a mixture and i love that i love the fact that the younger people are into it and uh, i feel quite proud of that rather than just doing the same thing to the same people you know i think it's much more fun to try and explore new territories as i said before yeah i was a six-year-old when you released your first album so yeah. <laughs> in the intro i mentioned the collaboration with rip the band from yeah. skopje now i wanted to ask you how that happened and also, how was the mini Balkan tour with them? Well, we first played with them, I don't know what, exactly what year, but it was probably about maybe five years ago in Skopje. I always mm-hmm. have struggled saying it properly. So, <laughs> don't worry. Uh, and I really like their group and they're really nice people. And then subsequently, a few years later, this kind of Balkans tour was, was organized. And, and we also went to Albania on our own. Mm-hmm. And we got them really well and they drove us around. It was just a really nice company. And easy company and uh they were doing their new record and they were the ben ferris fed who does our sound uh, and sometimes plays bass with us mixed maybe even produced maybe produced and mixed their last record mm. uh so there was the link there and they asked me to they had a song that they thought it might be nice if i sung on it and so they gave me the music and uh i just walked around for like a few weeks with just the instrumental track in my head and then came up with the words and sent it to them and they liked it so it was it was a pretty simple process really cool if it wasn't music what would david best doing right now like maybe playing football Uh, i'm a bit old for that now Uh, (laughs) maybe football manager i don't know yeah yeah, well i i studied art at university so Mm -hmm. uh i did screen printing stuff like that printmaking so maybe I would have followed that path, but music was always, I, I kind of went there to, to be in a band, really, that cliche, that kind of art school cliche that uh, you, you, a lot of the great bands meet in those kind of places. So uh, yeah, I didn't, that didn't happen for me, but mm-hmm. that was my my path. 
when you look at other musicians, you know, like your peers, what do you see? You're like, gosh, I wish I could do what they do. You know, like there's certain bands that just, you know, they're just, they're different than you and they have success doing their totally different thing, but it's just unattainable for you. You know, cause I've talked to a lot of musicians and they see that like, man, I wish I had that tone when I grabbed a Fender, you know, Telecaster, but I just, you know, what you do is great, but you see something yeah. wonderful. You know what I'm saying? I think, I mean, I always wish I could, I had a more expansive voice. Because mm. I love, I love. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I was never supposed to sing when we, me and Steve started. It was just instrumental. But I always used to write words. But he said, "Why don't you just try whisper like Dama Suzuki from Cat?" <laughs> so I went, "Oh, okay." <laughs> and it's kind of so. I was never supposed to be the singer. That was never my ambition. I was always just a guitar player. So I'm always kind of envious of of great singers. And I'm very some as well as electronic stuff. A lot of my favorite music is kind of '60s soul stuff and northern soul. And when you hear those voices that kind of really resonate emotion, that makes me jealous. But yeah, <laughs> but uh, but nothing really now does. You know, uh, obviously, I'd, it'd be nice to be more successful and be more well known. But I like a lot of current stuff. But nothing makes me go, oh, I wish I, I wish I could do that. I'm quite happy following, plowing our own field. Yeah. I like to find the sweet spot in things apparently with you because this is, I keep asking these sweet spot based questions. So yeah, of course, in a band, you want to have more success and everything, but there's also, you get to still have your life and do the things that you want to do, right? Like all of a sudden you can become a slave to your own success, either like you can't go out or you have to constantly tour to promote the thing because you're in this expansive, you know, explosive growth era. If you guys kind of stayed at this level right here, successful, able to make money being musicians, all that kind of thing, would that be good enough? Or do you think that you're willing to risk like getting, I don't want to say too big, but risk the freedoms that you have now for more success, more money, more notoriety? Yeah. I, d I mean, realistically, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I'm quite happy with that. Uh, I, I think often, I think that gives us uh our longevity you know we kind of for we sure. don't have to we don't have to tour we've all got young kids we, we can't be away for weeks and weeks and weeks yeah uh it, we can just we can just do and it feels like uh now there's a slight increase in interest and that's nice but mm -hmm. it's not it's not obtrusive <laughs> it's uh it just, I think it kind of suits us. And it, and I do feel because of that, we can make whatever records we want to. There's nothing, no one's saying you've got to do, you've got to do this record again, or you've got to, you should do that record. It's, we're, it's only down to us. We have no exterior voices saying in, in our ears about anything. So, yeah. That level of freedom is sweet. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> not worth a lot to sacrifice, you know? No, I don't think so. It's, uh, yeah, no, I think that's quite special and, it's, and we should try and keep hold of it. Yeah. What's next for GN Miyagi? Did you start working on a new album or maybe well, going I, back on tour? Yeah, I've been trying to write some songs, but I need to do the accounts as well. So <laughs> uh, it's kind of, uh, but so uh, we haven't really got together. Often we write separately. I, th I think, I think uh, we would like the next record to be more of a, in performance wise uh, as a group so i think we, which we the last one definitely wasn't so i think it's nice to, to turn that on its head so i think we'll, maybe we'll get together come up with a few ideas and then see how they pan out maybe in the next few months hopefully how was your time in skopje i'm trying to convince pete to come here on vacation so you can tell him why he should or should not come here on vacation me bit host. <laughs> well yes the first the second or the first time i think we've been there the first time we went there it was so snowy and so cold yeah it was so cold yeah i remember yeah it's unbelievable uh, and then the last yeah. time i mean i know this happens with 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 the uh, weather but uh it was the absolute opposite the people are very very nice very interested it's a great place to go and it and uh it's kind of quite nice because often Groups just go to the same old places like London, Paris, uh, San Francisco, New York, blah, blah, blah. But it, it's kind of far, far more interesting. This is just talking about being a British group. It is to go to Albania or Macedonia or uh, South Korea or Colombia, you know, or Bogota. It's kind of 
these are the opportunities that I otherwise wouldn't have had. I probably wouldn't have gone to Macedonia if I wasn't in a group. Yeah. But having gone there, I'm really pleased I have. I'm kind of fascinated by the statues. Oh. And often they say that, so Pete, they say that they've got statues of like Macedonian heroes, but then the, also some people say that they're not actually Macedonian. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite an interesting thing to experience. And I enjoyed, you know, walking around there. What is it about China? I know you said it was new, but explore that China thing with me where they if you're called to it. What is it beyond just the newness or the unknownness about it? I'm probably reading too much into it, but I'm a, I'm a huge fan of J.G. Ballard, the writer, and he grew up in Shanghai. And all his a lot of his novels are, have waterlogged fields, like rice fields or like abandoned swimming pools. And, and when I was there, or, or like these kind of, new places like there's a uh there's a couple of relatively new cities in, in china that look like they've just sprung up from nowhere but mm -hmm. they're covered in this kind of greenery that looks like a just straight out of a jg ballard novel mm -hmm. and that intrigues me uh the the audiences intrigue me because it, it feels like it's the birth of something it feels like it's kind of new relatively new for them for groups like us to come over you know yeah. and it's new for us to play to to that audience so there's a kind of a, a bit of a culture shock like encores always seem to really confuse the audience it's like why are you going off and then you have this kind of <laughs> awkward silence of like a hay bale and you think oh so maybe we better go back on and then <laughs> so we go back on and then they're like yeah really happy again so so it, it, i don't know it's just it's just something different mm -hmm. it's very rare that when you, you go around the world that you experience anything different because everything's so has such similarities because globalization whatever but yeah. china and russia and a few other places you do really feel like you're definitely in a different country and that's kind of interesting how often do you guys call an audible on stage based on the audience's response like maybe you i don't know maybe you vamp a little more and you do some crowd interaction because they're really loving a song how often does that happen in a show how how unique is one of your each one of your shows well there's definitely four or five tracks that expand or or get shorter depending on certain constraints or how well it's going but i think that the thing is when a show's going well you just relax so you become more we're not naturally extrovert performers mm -hmm. but when it goes well you, you you just shoulders relax and you just play better and, and i might do more things on guitar or you know uh, or steve might make some more odd noises or there might be more drum fills or whatever but it, it just it feels like a that being cheesy it feels like a, a partnership like between the audience and the group uh, it feels like you're, you're on each other's side sometimes early on when you're in a group you have to try and impress people or people go to be impressed because they don't know you and like, who are these guys? But when you've been going for a while, this is not just China, this is just in general, mm -hmm. our audience, the people come to see us because they like us. Yeah. So it's like, right. Okay. So we're all on the same side uh, and it, it makes the show so much better. Is that different than festivals where the crowd is not there because they like you necessarily, but they definitely want the festival experience. So they do like you. They just may be waiting for band, a band, two bands from now, you know? Yeah. It's kind of a, I love playing festivals. Yeah. Uh, it's a great venue for yeah. bands. Yeah. It's great. You get it's people see you who have never, who would otherwise wouldn't. Also you finish early generally. Yeah. <laughs> so you can watch other bands. Yeah. You watch other bands and it's just walking around. It's, it's, it's really nice, but you can kind of see, Sometimes you'd have the people right in the front who got there at nine because they want to see the band who are on at two in the morning and they're going to stay there all day and they're not interested. And that's okay. Yeah. But then you just see sometimes pockets of people who, as the set starts, they're like, who are these? And then after a while, you see them dancing. We, we, we're quite lucky because we, we seem to have a physical effect on people who like us. It seems to be quite easy for us to make people dance. So when you can see people dance, you know things are going well, you know? Yeah, yeah, irrespective if it's your audience or a festival audience, it's kind of oh yeah, everything's fine. Uh huh. Uh huh. No, I love it. And to have the chance to market to them your sound, your brand of fun and party is—it's neat to see it work. Like it's got to be satisfying as an artist to go, yeah, we still do this. People still can discover us and 
fall in love with our music and go to the website and whatever. I mean, that's that's those are all big, big wins. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to just stay the same on any level in yeah. terms of musically or or an audience. So yeah, totally agree. So you're a big shot rock star up in front of a band on a stage and all these, you know, you get to travel around to China and Macedonia and all these things. But like everybody, you still got to take out the rubbish. You still have to clean your bedroom, all those normal sure. things. So what's something that's that's just normal in your life? Where you're like, yeah, some big rock star I am. Here I am waiting at line, you know, in line for my driver's license or something. What's <laughs> what's some of the stuff where, where it just it's funny to you because of what you do and how notable you are, and yet here you're doing the most mundane thing? Well, I mean, I, I don't really think of myself as particularly notable, but I suppose it's uh, I send all the records off, so all the pre-orders that come for us for Bandcamp, yeah. I, I, I send them all off. So when we're just about to do a record, and I got to uh, I, I go to the post office with like two hundred records, <laughs> and I got to I got to know the people who, who work behind the counter quite well, and uh, I invited them to a show, and he brought his wife, and he came to the show, so that was quite nice. So I made a new friend, mm. but it just feels part of the process. It doesn't feel particularly different. I mean, when I was younger. And I still worked in, in a, a, a nine to five Monday to Friday job when we were just starting and we'd go away for the weekend and we'd, we'd play, say, like in Norway and Sweden or we'd play in Spain and we'd come back on Monday and we'd be at the desk. That felt like some kind of like a, a double existence, you know, like a secret life, secret, marginally successful electronic act <laughs> and, uh, and an ad- admin. But I don't know. It does feel like all the same thing now. You started in the late 90s. How do you feel the internet and the technology has impacted the music industry? Well, initially, I was just like, no one's buying records anymore. You know, where does mm. this leave us? But yeah. but the the reality of it is, you know, so what? I mean, you just got to deal with it. This is the reality. And that's the, also the, the pros kind of outweigh the cons, like the immediacy, people can discover you so much more easily there's nothing that the obstacles have lessened between the artist and the listener the only struggle is getting them to know you still but even that's easier with like social media and stuff so i mean it's not my favorite thing to do and i don't know if we're that particularly great at it but the options for you to get your music heard have increased so much more and as we are our own label we benefit that way. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's easier to put your stuff out. It's easier for anybody. You don't have to even necessarily play an instrument well, as long as you can program sounds, you know, you can. So it really is completely democratic, but to stand out is still, it's still a motherfucker of a fight. You know, you guys should check David's work out on fujia miyagi dot co dot uk i'll put that into the uh into the show notes so you guys can find it and support you guys is the best place to support you uh, at the website is it on twitter is it on myspace what do you where do you want folks to go to consume your stuff dave band camp's always good that goes directly to us uh i think that that's been a godsend for for musicians and uh if anyone did want to buy stuff i will send it out at my friend's post office <laughs> But, uh, but so yeah so so that's kind of the best place but uh, always good to support local record shops as well so yeah and if you guys are trying to figure out where the Bandcamp link is you can absolutely go to the Twitter site it's Fujia and Miyagi and on Twitter in their bio it's right there their Bandcamp on their Instagram and you can see everything there and, and be able to follow what they're doing and, and where they're going on tour and, and if you want to give David some Wonderlust send him Send him a book about your favorite town, you know, and uh, and maybe he'll be like, I just can't wait to get to the Green River in Texas and go play some <laughs> festivals. <laughs> David, do you want to cover anything else at all? I'm happy if you're happy. Thanks so much for, for chatting. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks, David, for coming on the show. Awesome to have you on. And really, seriously, everybody, I mean, these guys do great stuff. So go support them. Uh, either follow on Twitter or Instagram, uh, buy a record, you know, like, yeah, make David go down to the post office and see his friends. <laughs> but this is how this is how bands like this live and survive now. And what these guys are doing is really special. So check it out and and let me know what you think. And then maybe we'll get David to come on and do an album fight with us. Oh, yeah, that'd yeah, be good. Be awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much. Thanks, David.